Hey, everyone. It's Wednesday, October 19th. Today on The Final Bar, I'll be talking with Hema Reddy, joining us on the show for the first time. We'll talk about this choppy market environment, the S&P finishing the day just below 3,700. Is this the end of this raging bull market phase? Let's figure it out. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a smoky Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in these markets using the power of stock charts, the uh, tools, education, and commentary that you can use to hopefully make better decisions and address the challenges of these markets in difficult times. Uh, we've talked a lot in uh, 2022 about all the different competing narratives, right? Strong dollar, higher rates, the Fed activity, um, geopolitical issues, the war in in, uh, in Ukraine, all of these different things. Now we have earnings with a bunch of other, uh, you know, sort of narratives to, uh, to combine. At the end of the day, charts are really cool because what they help you do is cut through those narratives and focus on the evidence uh, present in the markets. We're going to get to a bunch of charts here in a few moments. Did want to let you know about the schedule we have coming up. Today, I'm excited to have Hema Reddy on the show uh, for the first time. I've actually been uh, excited to bring her on. Really excited we're able to uh, to line that up for today. Tomorrow, we have Jeff Huge from JWH Investments. Jeff is a fantastic stock picker with a, a wide following in the institutional community. Next week on Tuesday, the 25th, we have Bruce Frazier, educator and a pioneer in Wyckoff analysis, and then Miss Schneider of Market Gauge joining us next Wednesday, the 26th. I want to continue on today's show, recapping these market environments. Again, the goal of this show is to update you on what happened today, but you've probably followed uh, the activities in the market before this moment. What we try to do is connect today's action with the longer term trends. What have we learned about these markets differently in the last uh, eight or nine hours? Let's go through the charts together here. The S&P 500 finishing about two thirds of a percent lower, uh, sort of chopped around at the open, went down uh, until after lunch. And then recovered a bit going into the close, but still below 3,700. And I find in this sort of environment, when you're sort of chopping around and, and where the future uh, direction is uncertain, which I would say it's fair, uh, mo most likely a, a good way to describe this current market, paying attention to those key big round numbers can be helpful, right? Where are we at relative to 3,600, 3,700, 4,000 if we would get uh, back up to those levels, which I'm sure we will at some point. So getting below 3,700 and, and seeing if we're able to uh, regain that through the course of this week would be uh, would be in pretty uh, pretty key. As a reminder, a lot of earnings this week, uh, as well as um, triple witching day, which comes up on uh, Friday, which usually means a little little extra volatility, a little extra uh, excitement to the day. The Nasdaq composite down as well, a little bit more than the S and P, and the mid and small cap indexes both down uh, much more than the S and P. The mid cap index down one point eight percent. With uh, equity prices down, volatility increased a bit with the VIX just below 31 here uh, going into the close. Looking elsewhere, uh, interest rates really pushing higher through the course of the day. The 10-year yield finishing the day above 4.1%, uh, which is uh, which is quite a reach. Yesterday, we finished right at 4%. Today, we're sort of continuing to go to the upside as bond uh, prices continue to deteriorate. The dollar pushing higher, and it is really hard with the strength in the dollar for risk assets to do well. And we've seen that through much of 2022, and it's very much uh, in a smaller version of that, what we uh, what we saw today. Commodities mostly in the red, gold and silver in particular down over 1%. The broader commodity space, not too bad. And energy actually did okay with oil prices up a bit. The USO, which is a U, uh, oil ETF, was up about 2%. And energy was certainly the strongest sector out of the 11. Uh, and it was not even close compared to the rest. We'll get to that in a second. Cryptocurrency is a bit of a mixed bag as well. Bitcoin and Ether uh, prices both lower. Ethereum back below 1300 And Bitcoin still struggling to get above 20000 And I've often talked about sort of lines in the sand. It was great. My conversation uh, yesterday with Dana Lyons, we talked about sort of that line in the sand idea, right? At what level do you agree to revisit a position or revisit a thesis? For me, Bitcoin 20000 is one of those levels. 
as long as we remain below 20,000, how excited do I want to get about this uh, about this cryptocurrency that can't get above that key level, right? Once that happens, then we maybe revisit it and think about the potential for further upside. But first things first, and it's uh, not able to do so just yet. Briefly looking at a chart of the S&P, I know um, I guess today we're talking before the show with uh, with Hema Reddy, and I know we're going to spend a little bit of time on the S&P. So just to briefly show you what happened today, yesterday was one of those interesting gap higher but trade lower days. Never makes you feel particularly good about the short term sentiment when we gap up but then there's not enough follow through, right? And when you gap higher and close lower, that's one of those little warnings in my head thinking, all right, the excitement that investors felt to push prices prices higher uh, overnight really didn't continue. And you sort of distributed through the course of the day, a lower close again today uh, after yesterday's uh, brief drop. And again, we're still well above 3,500, which was the low from uh, about a week ago. That's the uh, low for 2022. Uh, and that's certainly if we would continue to sell off 3,500, a key level uh, most likely to pay attention to, because that's where we bottomed out previously. Just to continue on our market recap today, looking at sectors, the energy sector up big today, up almost 3%, and everything else was flat to down. Communication services and technology were number two, and we're, uh, we're basically flat or down about a quarter of a percent. The drags on the index performance today were in REITs, down over 2.5%, financials down 1.5%, healthcare down one5 of four percent, so quite a mixed bag of offense and defense on the on the top and the bottom. You have energy at the top, you have uh, utilities toward the bottom. Uh, sort of a, a a mishmash of sector returns through the course of the day. What are the brief things to let you know about? Netflix with a nice gap higher. This is one of our three and three charts at the end of the show yesterday. And as we're uh, doing it, they're reporting earnings and we're, we're thinking about what may happen the next day. What we talked about on yesterday's show that was that 250 level. What's interesting about a chart of Netflix, bottomed out around 170 in May, retested that in June, and then reverted back to the upside. Hit that 250 level first in mid-August, pulled back to the 50-day, and then three more times, four more times, we bounced right again that against that same level around 250. So the question was... They do have a good earnings report, which apparently they did, right? Subscriber numbers going up. Uh, you know what? What's the uh, what's the the uh, reaction look like today? And as you can see, uh, Netflix having a pretty decent day, up thirteen percent, gapping above two hundred and fifty. So what does this tell me? So number one, I'm certainly looking at that two hundred day moving average, which is right almost where we touched today. We get above there, and there's not much resistance on this chart until well above current levels, or kind of at potentially that last level. If we would pull back, let's say everything starts to come off uh, Thursday and Friday of this week, something like this holds 250, and that's a pretty decent breakout, and it's holding uh, support. That's pretty a common technical pattern where you break out above a level of resistance, particularly a well-established one. You pull back to that level, and that's the springboard to move higher. Um, so if you would pull back, 250 is a pretty interesting level to uh, pay attention to. So Netflix, obviously, one of the biggest gainers today, and certainly a chart to, uh, to keep an eye on uh, going forward. You know, when I'm looking at the other stocks that are gaining today, it's a lot of energy, as I mentioned. Energy was up the most today. Oil prices moving higher. Um, uh, the XLE having a decent day and a lot of individual names as well. I was scanning for stocks making new swing highs and lows for my market misbehavior premium members earlier today. And a lot of the names that we came up with were in two sectors, energy and financials. And energy in particular, um, stocks like Valero, really not even quite getting above their August high, but just a nice reaction off of uh, the uh, the low in uh, in September. And a lot of the names we've talked about, things like FANG and, uh, and DVN, and while not all of these certainly making new highs, many of them are sort of at that level. It feels like the energy sector really close to this significant breakout point where all of a sudden you're seeing a, a big move to the upside. Certainly a sector to watch. And as we've talked about, um, you know, energy in a lot of ways has been one of the great themes of 2022, particularly in the first half of the year. But after taking a break June through August, as the uh, growthy stuff was working, energy really re-exerting itself and focus on the strength in relative uh, in the relative strength, right? The, the the movement in the relative strength on a lot of those energy names. I think that's the most compelling part of those uh, of those charts, not necessarily uh, the uh, the price movements. Finally, I'll highlight airlines, a lot of them gapping higher today. United Airlines up about 5% today. Again, uh, in, in a short-term environment, what does that mean? That's pretty encouraging. But again, a chart like this, it's really hard for me to get excited about a chart like UAL because it's not a particularly attractive chart, right? Compare this to some of the stocks that are recovering, that are showing strong relative strength. You're seeing short-term gains, but it's not even getting above key resistance levels yet. Get excited, in my opinion, 
when charts like UAL, like cruise lines and others don't just rally, but actually show positive momentum through resistance. That's a different feel to the chart, a change of character, if you will. And I don't know if we've necessarily seen that yet with airlines. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Hema Reddy. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. We're going to bring on today's guest, Hema Reddy, here in a few moments. A couple quick announcements before we do it. First off, we welcome your questions. We do a mailbag twice a week, and we'll do one on Friday show. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We are on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Church YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. All of our previous episodes and uh, fantastic guest appearances like Hema Reddy and uh, Dana Lyons and uh, Katie Stockton and Miss Schneider and so many others, all are available for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Hema Reddy. Hema is the founder of HemaReddy.com, author of a couple of books on GAN analysis, which I found really, really compelling, a different toolkit than uh, a lot of the things that I follow. Hema, it is great to see you and welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. It's awesome to be here. been a long time since we reconnected and I uh, love what you're doing here with Stock Charts. It, it saddens me that, uh, Hema, you were one of those people that I, I used to see often at CMT <laughs> events when we could all get together in person. Hopefully, we're at that point where that starts to happen more often, but We'll do yes. it virtually for now, and it's awesome to see you. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Your uh, first chart, we were talking before we uh, went live about the S&P 500. We have a chart of the SPY just to talk through it. How are you making sense of these markets here? Okay, well, the SPY is a chart that my traders monitor a lot because a lot of them trade options on it. My real baby, if you will, is the underlying E-mini S&P 500 futures. So we'll stick to the SPY because I just feel like that's a broader way to look at the market. And what I've been seeing is ever since we had the rollover back in mid-August, uh, bringing in GAN concepts, I look at it a little bit like Elliott waves, but they're not so strict. And so mm. GAN has a concept called drives and markets move in three to four of these drives. So the way I see it now, off of that August high, if you go back towards that 200 AMA, yep, it looks like we're in a third drive down. And big, big picture, this has forecasting that comes in in November to February. So I can't pinpoint that far out, but I know that there's a probably significant low that will happen then. I don't know if it's going to be the low, but a low. Um, <laughs> what I am seeing right now, which is really fascinating, is that coming into this week, so last weekend, I sat and looked at 20 top markets, including the SPY index ETFs, commodities, uh, Netflix, and the other FANG stocks, as well as the top major uh, FX pairs. And yeah. I had calculated a forecast for the S&P, SPY, to fall into October 26th on the weekend. And all of the action happening the past two days has given me a second forecast landing on the same date. So because you're my friend, Dave, and because I want your listeners to have something actionable, okay, this is not advice, you have to do your own study, but I'm pretty confident that we're going to be weakening on the SPY into October 26th. So I am navigating these markets by taking them one small cycle at a time within the context of my bigger forecasts. I love it. When I when I think of your book, um, uh, Hema, that I read recently, it, it, it's, GAN is so interesting about combining those relationships of price and time. That's what's always struck me about it. It's the cycle, but it's also the price movements. And I feel like now more than ever, we kind of need to think about that relationship. So interesting, a potential October low to look forward to. Your second chart, we talk often on the show about uh, the VIX, and usually on Thursday, we do a little sentiment review. Here, we're looking at VVIX, or on, on stock charts, it's dollar sign VVIX. It's the VIX of the VIX. Can you talk us through what this is and what it's telling you? Oh, okay. Well, as you can tell, I'm not a seasoned stock charts user, so I meant to just pull up the good old regular VIX if we can oh, do Oh, perfect. That. <laughs> okay, we'll do that too. That's easy. Okay. Although the VIX it. of the VIX, that, that's some intense stuff. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. All right. The regular VIX versus the SPX. Fantastic. So what I'm seeing is that if you head back to the highs from 
uh, March, so March 9th, and then over to May 2nd, that there's a nice clean trend line that we've just come into if you ended up connecting those. And we've hit that here on September 28th, and then again on October 11th and October 12th. So that is happening in conjunction with the RSI, which I also use, Dave, I love it, and I, I saw it on your other charts, rolling over relative to previous peaks. You know, mm -hmm. something I learned in my CMT study that really resonated with me was we don't, shouldn't just look at oscillators and indexes in these fixed uh, parameters. We should look at them relative to the behavior in that market. So it's not relative strength, it's the RSI and how it's acted on that market. So the VIX has been rolling over pretty close to the 70 oversold range. It was 68 back in April, and now we came to 71 and are rolling over. So I'm thinking that gives a little bit of hope to short-term bulls, but again, because on the SPY, I'm seeing that declining to October 26. I think there's a little more uh, room for the VIX to kind of pump up, but it's got a, a big barrier here with those highs from September, which you can see in those you know last uh, 10 bars or so in your chart. Yeah, really, really interesting. So going back to your comment, Hima, we have about two minutes left. Going back to your comment about the um, the, the S&P selling off, potentially a bottom coming up here in the next you know week or so. What does that mean between now and year end? Does that mean we go into that? I mean, in seasonally, right? It's sort of that natural time when stocks tend to do well. Does this give us a sense of optimism going through year end? Or what would your toolkit tell us to expect after October 26? Because I, I know that's a concern for many. Oh, sure. So the great thing is that the way that I forecast, I have developed such that even if the forecast is missed, I can still extrapolate information from it. So I kind of mm -hmm. have to let the car get to that intersection in the road and then pivot. But I will say that looking at my weekly and my monthly charts, there is a bigger picture, more important low that, like I said, will happen between November and February. So what I'm talking about is October 26th. If you are selling short into October 26th, be careful, right? Mm -hmm. Because you may get caught in that bounce. But that bounce, I'm not saying is going to be, you know, the, the low of the year or the low of this season. I'll need a little bit more information on this fold. So I guess, Dave, that means you're going to have to have me back on in a few months. I can update my forecast. <laughs> I think that's the case. We're going to have to follow this closely, right? Yes. We only have about 30 seconds left, but I'd love to just think, I mean, just briefly, if you could, and again, because I, and and, and we need to talk more about your book, because I think it's really, 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 really well done. But when you think about the relationship between cycle and between trend, right? When when a cycle comes due, let's say the market doesn't react in October like you, like you might expect. How do you reconcile when the trend is telling you one thing, but a cycle is kind of coming due when you would expect a turning point? How do you relate those two, particularly when they disagree or when it's confusing? Sure. Well, price and the trend action is the king of the market. It's the king mm. of your chart. So I will consider what the trend is that's in place, but I mix it in with momentum and I have a tweak on the RSI that I use. So what I'm watching for is when we get into October 26th, are we coming right to that time target and making low? Are we pushing lower than my associated price with it, which you know I share with my members these forecasts regularly? Or does the market platform at a higher level than the forecast, indicating that bulls are stronger than we think? So it's kind mm. of like watching where the low happens into the time that helps you understand if the cycle is actually really in motion or if other trend forces are dominating over it. Hima, that's a beautiful answer. I feel like we're just scratching the surface. We'll have to do this again, but thank you for coming on the show today. It's great to see you again. Stay safe there in Texas. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Thanks, Dave, so much, and I'll see you again soon. Take care, everyone. That's Hema Reddy. Hema's the founder of HemaReady.com, uh, coming to us from Austin, Texas. And uh, again, as I mentioned or alluded to, Hema wrote a fantastic book on GAN analysis. GAN is one of those confusing areas of the market for many, particularly if you're not familiar with it. But at the end of the day, it really relates price and time. And uh, Elliott Wave and other methodologies try to do a similar thing. I think GAN's work in a lot of ways was formative for many traders. A lot of the things he talks about, about the relationship between the natural cycle and price movements, uh, you know, still very, very relevant today. So great take there from Hema Reddy. We'll hope to have her again on the show down the road. Let's continue on our show today with our next segment, Banking on Breath. What we like to do occasionally is check in on some of the breadth indicators, see what they are telling us about market conditions. So, you know, the S&P doing a particular thing, which is overall, I would argue, pretty much in a, in a consistent downtrend, but with quite a bit of choppiness here 
in the last couple of weeks, right? And and of course, as perfectly as we could have scripted right around when we're trying to do chart con is when it, things get really confusing and volatile. But it was awesome to try to navigate that period with all of our uh, fantastic guests. And hopefully you got a lot of good ideas about how to think about the remainder of the year. I had a lot of really good notes that I took uh, from some of those conversations. But breadth conditions tell us a little bit more about participation. And that is what about the individual stocks that comprise those indexes? What do those tell you uh, about the overall trend? And, and it's worth noting, uh, you know, when I was talking with a lot of the presenters and I asked them the desert island question, right? You're stuck on a desert island with one chart to help you navigate the rest of this year, what would it be and why? And the answers I got were fantastic. A lot of different things, some individual names, some sector ideas, um, different indicators, I, I, uh, some that I was very familiar with, some I was a lot less familiar with. But one consistent theme was looking at breadth and the most common response, including from people like Larry Williams and others, uh, was the advanced decline line, right? Simply looking at the breadth in the market by looking at the daily advancers decliners and looking at the trend in that uh, over time. Mark Chaikin and I talked a lot about uh, that sort of uh, of input and what it can tell you about the strength of the market. So it is not lost on me that while the S&P sort of narrowly made a new closing low in mid-October and on an intraday basis, obviously went down and touched uh, 3,500 for the first time in quite some time, it's worth noting to me that the advanced decline lines, many of them made a new low uh, so far in August, undercutting the September low. The advanced decline line on the New York Stock Exchange very clearly did so. The S&P's advanced decline line has made a new low for the year uh, here in the last week or so. Same can be said very barely by the, uh, the mid-cap uh, advanced decline line. One of the things that's interesting as I'm looking at this chart is that the small cap 80 line did not make a new 52-week uh, low uh, in October. It actually made a new low in September and, and actually did not penetrate that to the downside uh, in October. Um, just to digress briefly, I mean, if you look at the IWM, it might be a little hard to see if I look at the last two years, look at the last year, you can see how the relative strength in small caps has actually improved a little bit, right? So while the uh, large cap indexes and the NASDAQ have made a you know dramatic new low, um, the IDOM is, uh, IWM is holding its June low and the relative strength is actually improving over the last uh, six to eight weeks. So you're actually seeing an improvement in small caps while many of the cap tiers are struggling and the major averages, I would argue, have very clearly given a sell signal. The new Dow theory using the S&P and the NASDAQ made a new low in October. I think that confirms the broader downtrend still. Uh, to this point, tells me to be skeptical about any upside at this uh, at this point. It's worth noting to me that the small cap AD line has actually not made a new low, and that strength in small caps, partly as a number of people pointed out to me earlier this week, could be explained by a stronger dollar. That's totally fair. My response to that is, where was the small cap outperformance the whole rest of 2022 when the dollar was doing great? Small caps should have been fine, and they certainly weren't. Um, so there's been a rotation into small caps, and I think the breadth indicators. Uh, sort of uh, sort of support that. This is one of my favorite charts to use to think about market breadth, and it's looking at the percent of stocks above their 200-day moving average, percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. We're using the S&P 500 for both of those uh, indexes. As you can see, as of today's close, 20% of the S&P above their 200-day, which means four out of five S&P members are below their 200-day uh, moving average. I would be way more comfortable about a broader recovery if and when that indicator gets well above uh, 20%. 20% is a pretty low value. If you look historically, it's on the lower end of the range, of course, uh, and, and speaks to limited uh, upside so far for the individual stocks that make up the S&P. It's still only 22% of S&P members above their 50-day, which is obviously well below the 50% level, which is often what I use to differentiate a recovery, a true recovery from just sort of a brief bear market rally. And we can see that back here right in May. You can see that in uh, January, February, you can see that so far in October where the market has started to bounce, but this indicator remains below 50%. And that usually tells me this is probably a brief upswing, not enough to get too excited about. When the indicator gets above 50%, which it's done twice so far in 2022, once in mid-March and once in mid-July, that has told me it is a broader recovery, right? There are more and more stocks participating. As a matter of fact, over half of the S&P at that point would be above their 50-day, meaning they've regained that key sort of short-term trend indicator. That's what tells me to take the upswing more seriously, which is why in March and in July into August, we talked about the likelihood, the potential of the, of the market to make a much broader recovery and even retest the, uh, the previous highs. Now, both of those upswings obviously resolve to the downside eventually, but looking to see when that indicator gets above 50% is a key uh, benchmark for me. We're not there yet. 
Another thing to think about is just the lack of new highs, right? And, and what you have to remember before you get too bullish about these markets bouncing off of the lows is a true bull market phase, something to really get excited about and think about getting back into offense, in my opinion, means you have to see an expansion to new highs. Bull market phases are driven by stocks making new 52-week highs. Bear market phases are driven by stocks making new 52-week lows. These are the leadership names really driving that trend, right? So in a bear phase, you have a lot of red on this chart. These are all the stocks making new 52-week lows. And in a downtrend, in a consistent downtrend, you see a lot of red because these are a, an overwhelming uh, number of names making new 52-week lows. Um, just last week, I think this was last Friday, we had, third, let's see, where am I looking here? About 160 names out of the S&P 500. That's just over 30% of the S&P members all made a new 52-week low last Friday, I think that was. Um, that's a big number, right? That is a significant number. What you don't see a lot of on the chart here recently is any green, which would be stocks making new 52-week highs. Now, some energy names, as we alluded to earlier, are at making new 52-week highs like COP or really, really close to doing so. So if you do see energy recovery, you'll start to see some green on these charts, and that's most likely uh, energy in a small number of names and other sectors that are starting to improve. But to really get excited about a broader improvement in risk assets, I'd want to see a lot less red and a lot more green, and I'm just not seeing that yet in the picture of breadth. That's our segment, Banking on Breath, highlighting a couple of the breadth indicators I think they're important to pay attention to, but we need to wrap the show. Let's go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. And here is chart number one. Ten-year treasury yield just continues to be one of the key charts that I pay attention to. And, and often in interviews, I'm asked for just a quick soundbite, right? What's a quick takeaway to make sense of these markets? And I would say more often than not, my go-to chart is something related to interest rates because I think the chart of the 10-year tells you a lot of what you need to know about the activity of the Fed, uh, what the Fed is doing and how that's being reflected, not just in the bond markets, which is making uh, bonds deteriorate obviously quite a bit as yields go higher, but also in terms of equity leadership. Today, you have energy stocks up three or, or, or so percent. You have uh, more growth sectors actually flat to down on the same day. And that is what is causing this ratio to go higher. And this is the ratio of value versus growth using two of the, of the Russell um, ETFs. IWD is the value ETF. IWF is the growth ETF. This ratio goes higher, tends to go higher when rates are going higher because the higher interest rates make the earnings that these growth companies are uh, supposed to be generating going forward makes those future earnings a lot less valuable today relative to the interest rates uh, as they are accelerating to the upside. So higher rates tend to be better for value stocks. We have seen that through much of the last uh, 12 to 24 months, and I think we'll continue to see that going forward. Chart number two, big day for energy. Charts like Dino, D-I-N-O, which is uh, an E&P stock exploration and production, making new 52-week closing high today, up just over uh, or just under 3%. New relative high, which is what's so important. What attracts me to these energy charts is not just the price action, which arguably very, very strong, but it's the relative strength. Look at how well this stock is performing relative to the rest of the names out there. At this point, as of today's close, the top-ranked stock in our large cap scooter rankings is an energy stocks, D-I-N-O. Finally, Tesla, right? You have Netflix gapping to the upside. For every, one, every Netflix, you have a Tesla really testing new lows, right? So you have the May and June low around 200, 210. We're right back to those levels over the last week. We're bouncing off a bit uh, from that level as we come out of the oversold region. But the problem I have with this chart as NIO and uh, Rivian and other names that are in this same group making new 52-week lows. NIO was one I was looking at before uh, we went live on the show. Charts like Tesla may not be far behind that. And how well do you want to feel? How optimistic do you want to be if a chart like Tesla is below 200, right? Undercutting its low, making a new low for, uh, for 2022. Hasn't happened yet, but I think charts like this are very close to signaling a dramatic decline further than where we're at right now. I think that's a non-zero risk. I think it's, think it's something you should be prepared for. As an investor, what does your portfolio do in the scenario that charts like Tesla break down? I would think through that now before it happens so you have a good game plan. Folks, that is our show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Hema Reddy of HemaReady.com joining us from Austin, Texas. All of our previous episodes are at StockChartsTV.com. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.